Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. Greetings. My name is Jeff Ross, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at the Roswell United Methodist Church. Thanks for tuning in uh, to this time of worship, and I uh, hope that the scripture and the message uh, is helpful and God uses it uh, in great ways today. Let us begin with a prayer. God, we give you thanks for this day, for the opportunity to hear your word. Guide us and lead us in all that we do, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. And it says this, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit at his glorious throne. And all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from the other as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I was naked and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. And they will say to themselves also, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. May God add his blessing to our reading and hearing of his word. So 
So as you look at that picture, the question is not, do you get it? The question is, is it worth getting? And that's what I want us to look at in terms of our scripture today. Is this scripture something that's worth getting? I think that it is. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Uh, but it's also a, probably a busy weekend for you. Uh, if you're watching online, then you may be watching this at a different time. But uh, as we approach this Sunday and the theme for it, it's the last Sunday in the Christian year, usually the last Sunday in November. And so there's Thanksgiving and Black Friday, getting ready for Christmas, uh, dealing with family and friends. And all of those things are important and uh, weigh on our mind also. Uh, but in worship, as we approach this time, it's Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday in the Christian year. As we, next Sunday, we begin Advent with the Christmas stories and the Christmas songs and candles and uh, choirs and all of those things. And we celebrate uh, the beginning of a whole new year. But this passage from Matthew has been selected for Christ the King Sunday. Uh, and it it's, it's created to help us think in terms of the kind of king that Jesus is and, and claims to be. But the passage also creates a number of questions that have been hotly debated uh, over the years, uh, over the centuries, since the beginning uh, of the church. And there are questions that are still hotly debated uh, today. And, and in part, the question is, uh, is, is salvation... Um, earned or in, by or in part from our actions? Do we work our way into heaven by the basis of good deeds and uh, doing really nice things for other people? Uh, do we earn our way into heaven or is faith, or is salvation uh, a gift that we're saved by faith, uh, not by works, but out of God's grace and out of God's mercy? And so, um, and, and maybe the answer lies somewhere in the middle or a combination of those as, as we kind of think through the whole uh, lifelong uh, process of, of following Christ. But this question started off a, as a, uh, uh, a, a dilemma, a struggle, a debate in the early church. One of the first uh, uh, New Testament books that we find is James uh, chapter one and two where he spends a lot of time on this debate talking about the value of faith without works uh, and the importance of works compared to faith. And, and uh, people are saying, oh, well, I have faith and that's all I need. And at one point, James says, well, congratulations, you have faith. Uh, aren't you wonderful? Don't you know, though, that the demons also believe so that kind of put people in their place a little bit. And then a little later on in chapter two, verse 24, James says, a person is justified, as he's making his case for uh, this train of thought, James says, a person is justified by what they do and not by faith alone. And I like that he adds not by faith alone. So he is uh, acknowledging that faith has a place in that. Uh, and then if we turn to Ephesians chapter 2, uh, we find Paul's de declarative words in chapter 8, uh, where he says, For it is by grace that we are saved uh, through faith and not by works, so that no one can boast. And so Paul sets the stage for the understanding that we don't earn our way. Salvation is not something we grab, take hold of by what we do. And so that's, that was the debate then. It's the debate now. What, what place does faith play? What place do works play? Uh, certainly if we proclaim to have a faith and a belief and a changed and transformed heart, that there'll be evidence of that somehow. So how does that play out? So that's what I want us to dive into today uh, and to look at it because I do believe that it is worth getting. 
And part of the reason it's worth getting is to determine what kind of king Jesus is. If we celebrate Christ the King Sunday, then what kind of king is Jesus? Is he, is he a benevolent king that just dispenses grace and salvation to uh, anyone who believes? Uh, or does he expect on the basis of this gift uh, that somehow our lives produce fruit, uh, produce some sort of good works? And then what's the measure of those good works? Our scripture today sort of outlines a list of things that sounds like we ought to be doing. Uh, feeding the hungry, satisfying the thirst of uh, those that are thirsty, welcoming strangers, visiting uh, the poor, clear, uh, clothing the sick, visiting in prisons. And it appears if we just take this passage in a vacuum, uh, that salvation is merited simply based on what we do. In fact, if you look at the whole 25th chapter, uh, there are three stories, and all three stories talk about, faith, talk about action. Uh, they don't talk about faith, they don't talk about grace, they don't talk about believing, they talk about action. The first story is the 10 virgins who are waiting for the bridegroom, a, a few of them run out of oil, uh, and the only ones uh, acknowledged are the ones who had some oil in reserve. The second story is about the parable of the talents. Uh, people are given different uh, amounts of money and they're supposed to do something with the money to earn more money, invest it wisely uh, so that they, they earn money, uh, uh, earn something for the, the uh, landowner. And uh, the, the ones who do that are, are uh, appreciated. Uh, the, the one who does not is scorned. And so the whole, the whole chapter is about what we do. And so it, it creates this uh, dilemma, struggle, how important is that, how not? And it, it's funny, I, I, you know, you look over the years at sermons that have been preached and uh, commentaries and what people say about this passage. And it seems to kind of go along with some of the frustrating things about uh, the way we as humans look at stuff. Uh, and it seems that if... if um, uh, so many people take this passage and say, well, it, it can't mean what it says it, it, uh, it, it's saying because that contradicts what it says in Ephesians 2 and 8. So it must be something different. So they either ignore it or try to explain it away. And that, that's so frustrating uh, uh, in biblical times, in our time, as we look at the landscape around us. So many people come to faith or come to anything they want to believe with a preconceived idea of prejudice that they already have. And they're just looking for facts to back it up and they totally ignore everything else. Uh, and when we come to Scripture, we need to come to Scripture with an open heart and an open mind. What is the Bible saying to us? What is God saying to us? Not what do I want it to say or what preconceived ideas do I have, but what is it saying? And then how do I adjust my thinking to what it says and what the tradition and the understanding and the, the reasoning is? Uh, and so as we look at this passage, uh, there's clearly a debate in the early church. There's, there's clearly different voices advocating different types of things. And I think they're all on the same page, uh, but they, the one's trying to say works are important and the other one's trying to say, well, but faith is, is what's most important. It's God's work uh, because we can't take credit for our, our own salvation. That doesn't work. And, and so this, this struggle has happened uh, in the church. Um, and I think I'm going to take a stab at why I think this is happening. And again, this is, this is my thought. Uh, but here's the logic. When we think of our own judgment, just me, when I stand before God, I really don't want God delving into works and things I've done. All of us have things that we wish we hadn't done. We have things we uh, thought, said, did that we would love to take back. Uh, and so as we stand before God in the judgment, we don't want it to be based on works, do we? Uh, we love that passage where uh, we just read in Ephesians 2, 8, where Paul says, it's by grace that we're saved. We claim God's grace. We want God's grace. God, yes, yes, it's, it's grace that we're saved by. And we go, whew. Uh, escape that one. But, 
But here's the rub. Here's our humanness that just jumps out. When we think or when I think of other folks uh, and their salvation, I do want works involved. I, I do want works uh, considered. Uh, I don't want folks just to waltz into my heaven standing next to me uh, unless they've earned that, unless they've done something. So what have you done? What, what did you do? How did you live out your faith? Uh, it's funny, but that's how we think. Uh, that's how different denominations think think about other folks. That's how Christian community thinks about the non-Christian community. That's how other religions think about those other religions. We want to compare and we want to contrast. Um, And I think that's really it in a nutshell. The problem with that, that argument, is that it makes this all, this whole discussion about what does it take to get to heaven? And it it turns getting to heaven into a contest. Uh, It turns it into a race. Uh, It turns it into a competition. And it's like all of us have to have these sashes uh, across our chest. And every time we do a good deed, we have to put a, a new medal. And then when we stand next to somebody else, we're comparing medals and badges or uh, 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 the awards that we've been given. And, and that's not the intent of the Bible. It's not the intent of this passage. Uh, <coughs> it's not the intent of our faith uh, at all. This passage in the Bible is not a playbook for how we get into heaven. It was never intended for that. Uh, But it's most certainly been used to do that. The chapter's intent, this passage's intent, was stated in the first story of the ten virgins when it says to be prepared, be ready. Uh, It's about the kingdom of God, Christ the King's kingdom, uh, here and now. It's not about where we're going when we die and off there. In fact, very little of the Bible is about that. Most of it, almost all of it is about here and now and how we live and how we treat each other. When we talk about Christ the King, we're talking about now. We're not looking eschatologically uh, out into the future. We're looking at how everything happens around us. Christ is the King of here and now and this time and today. You know, when, when I was in college, we, we'd get a syllabus from a professor. I don't know if they still do this. Uh, and they would have, uh, th- get this many points uh, through tests and uh, homework and, and other things uh, for an A. This many points, you'll get a B. This many points, you'll get a C. And so you could look at the syllabus and you could say, yeah, I don't want to work very hard. I just want to see. So here's the minimum amount of points I have to get to get a C. And then you sort of uh, wa- walk through the semester uh, knowing that you don't have to do much work. Or if you want an A, here's the bar of what that means. Uh, some people just want the bare minimum uh, to pass. And I, th- I think this passage lends itself to that too. Because part of the debate over the years is, okay, let's look at this list in Matthew 25 that we just read. Uh, Feeders of hungry, satisfiers of thirst, welcoming strangers, clothing naked, visiting the sick, visiting prisoners. Okay, preacher, um, help me out with that. Do we, is this like multiple choice? <laughs> do, we, do we have to do two out of the six, three out of the six? What, what's the minimum of, and do we have to do uh, one of these good deeds once a month, once in our lifetime, every day? Uh, what, what's the bar here? What's the minimum we have to do uh, to pass? You know, and again, This story, this passage is not about that. It's not about the minimum. It's not about what's required to get into heaven. It's about how our lives are different because we've invited Christ into our lives. And so this passage really is about both. It's about the invitation of Christ in our heart, accepting that, believing that, having faith. But it's also then what do we do once we have faith and how do we act that out? And the, one, and the way in which we act that out is, is by uh, this transformation that takes place in us. Repentance, turning to Christ, is about uh, 
turning from the direction we were going in to a new direction, a new life. And once we enter into this new life, uh, we draw on the power of Jesus Christ in that transformational process uh, to help us be and walk and act in different ways. And so uh, it does matter that we do that. It does matter that we have both components, that we get that. Now, some, but, but we don't all do it the same way. And that's where I think a lot of frustration is. People say, well, you've got to do it this way because that's how I did it. Or you've got to do it the Methodist way or the Baptist way or the Pentecostal way. Uh, and that's, we come to Christ and we come to faith and we live our lives in different ways. Some people act their way into new ways of thinking. That's exactly what the disciples did. They followed Jesus around. Jesus said, do this, do this, go here, say this. Uh, the disciples watched Jesus day in and day out. And the culmination of those experiences changed their lives. And they began to think and act and, and respond in different ways. Ways different than how they started. But other folks think their way into new ways of acting. Other folks are more academic, more cerebral, and that was John Wesley. John Wesley was a brilliant scholar. Uh, he, he investigated, he looked at all kinds of different ways of, of thinking and pondered that, had conversations with people, uh, and, and, uh, and then attempted to act that out in various ways. Stumbled, fall, would go uh, study it some more, come back to it, uh, and eventually, he had this experience where his heart was, was strangely warmed, as he said, uh, and he finally got it. This years of scholastic endeavor finally sunk in, uh, and he got it. He understood, and he began to live in a different way. And so, is it important that we get it? Yes. Yes, it is important that we get it. It is important that we understand what God's trying to do in our lives and our world. It's important to understand how we can have faith, but also live that faith uh, in action. And so, maybe as we end the Christian year with Christ the King Sunday and begin the new year in Advent, maybe this Advent you could spend some time as you're decorating the tree or singing Christmas carols, spend some time thinking in new ways, listening. What is God saying to me? How do I understand this? Uh, reading the scripture stories in maybe different ways. Or, and or, maybe spend some time this Advent acting in new ways. Is there a way to get involved? Is there a way to spend some time? Is there something to volunteer with? Is there something to be a part of that would be new for you, that would be a new experience, that maybe you would understand the grace and love of God in a new way? Because yes, yes, it is important that we get it. Let us pray. God, lead us into this new week, this new season, this new Christian year, this season of Advent with your strength and power. For it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We wanna be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear serve with commitment, 
and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.